up guys, it's Kayla and Jim and welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. What are we going to be talking about today? Today we are talking about a topic that as a NASCAR fan I find very interesting and that is the NASCAR Vortex Theory. What is the NASCAR Vortex Theory? There have been many instances where storms will come up to a racetrack and appear to split and go around it or not rain as it goes over it and after witnessing this happen over and over and over, Daryl Waltrip and I believe Mike Joy also came up with this theory that says, High powered cars racing around an oval track creates a vortex of hot rising air that repels oncoming single storms. So what they're talking about here is just a single thunderstorm, not necessarily a line of thunderstorms approaching the racetrack. Right. While doing research for this topic, all I was able to find was like an ancient YouTube video from 12 years ago and a handful of Reddit threads with some very strong opinions, both positive and negative. So with that being said, let's dive in. But before we get started, <laughs> make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below so you never miss another Meteorology Monday. Let's talk about some of the tracks that we'll take a look at and be a good way to kind of set this up. First track we're going to look at is Bristol Motor Speedway, which has a top speed of about 131 miles per hour, a total length of a half a mile, and an average diameter of about 0.16 miles. Next is Charlotte Motor Speedway, top speed 194 miles per hour, a length of 1.54 miles, with an average diameter of 0.49 miles. After that, we're looking at Daytona International Speedway, which has a little bit of a higher max speed at 210 miles per hour, a length of 2.5 miles, and an average diameter of 0.8 miles. And finally, the last track we're going to look at is Talladega Super Speedway, with a top speed of 216 miles per hour, a length of 2.66 miles, and an average diameter of 0.85 miles. All of these tracks are ovals, with Bristol and Charlotte being chosen for their rounder shape and Daytona and Talladega having the fastest speeds. Going off of their top speeds, Bristol is the equivalent of about an EF3 tornado, Charlotte an EF4, and Daytona and Talladega being EF5 speeds. Those are some pretty fast speeds. EF3 to EF5, that, that is fast, very fast. Now some disclaimers, we know that in a tornado, the winds are all the way through, they're going constantly. We are aware that during a NASCAR race, sometimes there's caution, sometimes they're going slower, they're not all evenly spaced out, sometimes they're all bunched together, sometimes half of them are off the track, so it's not as consistent as a tornado. Also, tornadoes are completely circular, whereas the tracks are oval, that's why we gave the average diameter. But as you can see by those average diameters, it's pretty similar to some of the tornadoes that reach the EF3, 4, and 5 speed ranges. So really what we're considering is uh, green flag laps mm -hmm. where everybody's out on the track and going around. Again, they're probably spaced out every so often, but if there's one car that actually gets in an accident and starts to spin on its own, would we consider that a vortice, a multiple vortex tornado kind of situation? Or are we just going to ignore that If you that would like to, we can do that. <laughs> so this is just going to be an open discussion, trying to, you know, see the pros and cons and maybe this theory is correct or maybe it has some merit to it and maybe it doesn't. So let's take a look at some of the evidence that supports this theory and some evidence that doesn't support this theory. We have cars moving counterclockwise. The track surface and cars are significantly hotter than the air around it. The speeds the cars reach in our example tracks are equivalent to EF3 through 5 tornadoes. And the grandstands offer extra heat and block any wind made by the cars from escaping outside the environment. Like in any low pressure system here in the Northern Hemisphere, counterclockwise motion corresponds to rising air and hot air also rises. So far, this agrees with what the NASCAR Vortex Theory is saying. That's right. Counterclockwise motion mm -hmm. and hotter air, so supports rising here in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, okay, we'll give it to them. Yeah. Now let's look at what weather usually occurs with warm, moist, rising air. We're assuming the air is moist because all our example tracks are in the south and it's humid as heck in the south. <laughs> warm, moist, rising air is usually associated with cloud development. In fact, a small-scale current of rising air is the official NOAA definition of an updraft, which is a key ingredient in storm development. Now this would go against the theory 
that the column of air causes storms to split and go around the tracks. In fact, cool sinking air is what's known to kill storms. This is the opposite of an updraft, and we call it a downdraft. So yeah, this, this column of rising air is kind of what we need for cloud development. It's not known to break apart storms that are going over this column of air. So it starts to get a little bit iffy on the theory here. Let's take a different approach. Warm air is less dense than cool air. In thermodynamic terms, a parcel of warmer air has less moisture in it, and it takes longer for this warmer parcel of air to cool as it rises in the atmosphere and condenses into cloud droplets. This has to do with skew t graphs and math that we're not gonna get into, but for our fellow atmospheric scientists, this process is called raising the convective condensation level, or the CCL, of the atmosphere over the track. The main thing to note is that the warmer the air is at the surface, the farther up in the atmosphere that parcel of air has to get before it can condense into a cloud. Since the air coming from the track is hotter than the surrounding air, this column of rising air could create a bubble of sorts in the atmosphere over the track. And the storm, if it hits this, would basically decloud or uncondense the lower level of the storm, which would cause it to break apart. Since the atmosphere is a fluid, the storm would want to continue on the path of least resistance. So maybe it decides to go around this bubble and stay in the cool air around the track. Either way, this could support the storm avoiding the speedway or splitting when it hits it. So that's a very interesting theory. Let's talk about that for a second. So let's say the race is underway, mm -hmm. and let's say it's uh, mid-afternoon, so maximum heating as the, the cars and everything is heating up. If you take that same parcel of air that had a certain amount of moisture in it, and you just raise the temperature with keeping the moisture constant, mm -hmm. what you wind up doing is lowering the relative humidity. Right. So in order to take that parcel and now lift it, and get it to cool and start causing some sort of condensation, you have to raise it further because you're starting with a higher temperature at the surface right. than what you would have before the race start. So yeah, a warm bubble over the racetrack, interesting. The problem with this theory is that storms happen on a mesoscale, tens of square miles big, whereas a racetrack is much smaller. Anything happening on the track would be happening on a micro scale. The likelihood of a large storm cell that extends high into the atmosphere being influenced by something happening on a micro scale on the ground isn't very high. So even though we do have this kind of bubble in the atmosphere that could form, it would be happening over however big this racetrack is. Let's take Talladega being a big one. It's 2.66 miles all the way around. So if you turn that kind of into a square, it's not taking up very much real estate compared to what a storm cell would be taking up in the atmosphere. So any anomaly that's coming from the track, is it really going to influence something as big as a storm? But wait, we said that the cars travel counterclockwise like tornadoes and even reach speeds of EF3 to 5. And tornadoes influence storms, right? Well, what's happening on the track is closer to how a landspout or a dust devil forms. Tornadoes form from the cloud down and are always associated with a mesocyclone, or a spinning thunderstorm, which is called a supercell. Landspouts and dust devils form when spinning winds at the surface get pulled up vertically and can sometimes reach and connect with the clouds. But if these landspouts can reach and connect with the clouds, they aren't causing the clouds to split and go around it, are they? So even though the speed of the cars reaches tornado-type levels, the process of which the wind forming on the ground and kind of going up is more like a landspout and not a tornado. So, it wouldn't have as much influence with the clouds as something like a tornado would, which is fully connected and a part of the storm. So to wrap up our discussion, what's most likely happening when you see that storm split and kind of go around a racetrack is that the storm was most likely going to miss the track already, race or not. And this could be due to a number of things, such as... The upper level winds could be pulling the storm away, even though the low level clouds make the storm look like it's coming straight at you. Depending on where the racetrack is in relation to the radar site, the radar could be showing the storm moving slightly off from the path it's actually taking. Storms pulse, meaning they blow up, fall apart, and repeat. With the NASCAR vortex theory talking specifically about these single cell thunderstorms, the storm could just be falling apart and then build again past the track. You could be making a confirmation bias based on only a couple incidents. For example, say you've been to two different tracks and both times the storm went around you, what's to say that it hasn't rained during a race on a time that you weren't watching? 
And if this hotter air is drier than the cool air around it, when the storm hits and it starts to rain, the rain could be evaporating before it reaches the track or feel only like a sprinkle compared to the downpour that you see outside the speedway. So there's some things that support the theory and some things that disprove the theory. In the end, it's kind of impossible to test it or study it or research it because of all the factors that come into play. It would be really hard to set up a storm moving over a racetrack with cars and heat. It's just <laughs> not really something that you can recreate in a lab. But it makes for a fun topic of conversation and it is very interesting. Yeah. What do you guys think? Have you been at a racetrack when a storm went around you? Is there any theory that you have that could support the NASCAR Vortex theory that we didn't talk about? Do you agree with what we said? Do you disagree with what we said? Do you have a theory that disproves this? Leave all your thoughts in the comments below. We would love to hear what you have to say. So there you have the NASCAR Vortex theory. As always, be sure to check us out on social media, Facebook and Instagram, as well as checking out our School of Weather and our website, which we link down below. Until next time, I'm Kayla. And I'm Jim. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday. Until next time. I'm Kayla, and I messed it up, darn it. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs>